Yeah. Um, I'd like everybody to introduce themselves. David Brown. Just to pick things out. Nope, it's a good thing. New faces are always welcome. Brian Mish. Hey guys. I'm half Hello. blinded back here, so sorry. Right. Hello. <laughs> Just interested in what you're doing. Fair enough. All right. Uh, move along. I'm going to try to make this part of it a little bit short just because we do have a speaker today. Um, can I get a quick secretary's report? Minutes from the last meetings. See our secretary. You say that. Oh, I'm blind. Uh, well, the minutes are posted on the on the uh, Facebook page, and uh, I didn't really get any comments from anybody that they were inaccurate. And the only thing I'm going to do is now I'm to post them as a uh, PDF rather than a Word document, so that uh, in the event you don't have the Word software, you still be able to read it. Fair enough. Uh, if anybody actually wants to see the minutes, we can go ahead and pass these out. Oh, nobody here actually likes yeah, to read the minutes, time. so you've got them in printed form. It's very informal in many respects. Yeah, I see somebody else who snuck in that hasn't introduced himself. It was a second meeting. Come on, dude. You were here the last one, were you? It was a second meeting in six months. Fair enough, fair enough. That's funny. Anybody want to? So I'll let everybody get a quick look at these. There we go. Oh, there you go. Airport, sir. All right. Last call. Going once. Give you all about a minute to read them, and then somebody can make a motion to accept them. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and make that motion now. Feel free. I make the motion. We accept the minutes as written. Second. All right. There's been a motion made to accept the meetings as written. All in favor, signify by the sign of aye. Aye. All opposed, same side. And accepted. All right. Treasurer's report. We uh, finished last year with a balance of $565.78 in the account. Uh, last session, last meeting, we had uh, uh, another total of $260 come in, and there's been a number of items today, so cash balance will be probably about $1,200 when we're done. Yay, we're growing. And here's a copy. Anybody like one? Nope. All right. Sure. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Like I said, rolling right along. Uh, 4-H update. Actually, don't know anything about that right now. Well, I can talk a little bit. By all means. Okay, today, Miss Ella uh, went down to Queen Wright Colonies, and uh, Queen Wright Colonies donated to her basically uh, a hive with a super uh, bottom board, top cover, and stuff. Uh, she got a hive tool, uh, a veil, um, a smoker, some gloves. So she got a, a really good start uh, from uh, Queen Wright Colonies uh, today. Uh, we picked an interesting day to go because they were unloading a semi truck full of bees. So we got to uh, kind of watch that. And uh, Ms. Uh, Peggy Garms was also there. And I got to see her marking queens. I've never seen that before. So that was kind of interesting for me to see. Uh, there is a posting on Facebook. Basically, it was just a thank you to uh, uh, Queen Wright Colonies, and there will be some pictures to follow. And um, and I didn't get a cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was the change as of today. Uh, you have, Ed, do you have anything kit? for for her? Pardon? You have a diagnostic kit for her. <laughs> Well, oh, hurt way, man. You can't walk away. You have to get back over there. <laughs> Sorry. It, 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 comes, it, comes, it comes with the job. Go ahead and get 
like, yeah, like okay, up here. So we get a picture of you guys all Some, together real fast. Okay? Especially since we're webcasting. Yeah, yep. somewhere in between the table Come and the up. podium. You're going to be a YouTube star. <laughs> there you go. Over there. Really so that is one thing I'll mention in the downtime is that we are trying to webcast all of our meetings, uh, which is both good and bad because I probably look like a fool, but they are good for prosperity or posterity. Um, so any of the classes that we have, any of the lectures that you hear, you can go back and rewatch them if there was any questions or if you wanted to look at something again. Uh, also super useful if you're not here. So. Okay. All right. Now for the real pictures. <laughs> okay, you want to turn around and grab it? Alice, you want to get it? There we go. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. You have to donate. Thank you. Not a problem. Uh, OSB eight. That was that, that yeah. was that was one. No, that was not donated by OSB eight. That was Kathy. That was yep. Oh, yes. We, that we was. Thank you. Yeah. Definitely. All right, website update. Do you have anything else on 4-H for the other half? Because we have two 4-H um, <clears throat> members in the club, right? Uh, just, I'm, I'm going to make this one real short so we can get out with our meetings because we're already late. It's okay. Shane's already got his stuff. Uh, but so hopefully they live close. They'll be working together and they'll be at some of the meetings to share information with what's going on. I've also contacted uh, Terry and Peggy at OSBA. They wanted to send out a super thank you, thank you to the folks in this club for what you've done and a very powerful statement to support our kids. So, oh, we are a strange group, but we are growing. <laughs> <laughs> um, website update. Um, I know we have a gentleman who has a major background in websites, but we do need to set up like a committee to help support him. Um, so realistically, the update is, is who wants to be on the committee? We're starting to get enough people to make that happen. I'll be on it. Okay. Um, you're gonna see the gentleman in the back. Raise your hand. James is the web guy. So if you would hook up with him, um, We'll probably have some links to our YouTube channel, uh, obviously links to our Facebook group, and we'll start trying to get more information up there. Uh, at some point, it might be worth reaching out to the farm parks and seeing if we can throw cross links between those as well. But, right. I believe OSBA will host it. OSBA will host it, but we got to talk to them. Uh, so if you would talk to Creel, he can tell you who to hook up with uh, Ohio State as far as to get their web address and all that. Uh, sure, kid. Yep. <laughs> I like to throw him under the bus, too. Okay. <laughs> if we can figure out a meeting time and what you guys want on the website, would be helpful. So at the end of the meeting, if you three would link up, that would help. Yeah, who's the third one? Ed? Yeah. 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 All right. Observation pipe plants. Uh, I provided some plans. Um, as far as I know, there's some movement on that. Um, For the observation night? Yeah. Um, it should be ready anytime. That's like my last code of finish on it. So it's going to need the frames blast in. So you're going to have to make arrangements with the glass doctor. Okay. So I can bring in here or whatever the frames. Okay. Um, and we talked to him earlier about that. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. We'll have an observation hive that'll be put in back uh, in the greenhouse. Yeah. So, you know, that's a that's a valuable resource as far as teaching people, you know, about the bees. Um, this is a fairly large observation hive. This is the full 20 frames, uh, 10 frames, sorry. Um, so it's it's a full deep box. Um, when we start actually using that, uh, is there anybody that wants to take charge and actually manage that? I, I can do it if someone gives me some supervision to start with. Absolutely, I will help. Oh yeah. I don't have any problem with that. 
I have never honestly managed an observation hive, so I can't tell you I'm an expert on an observation hive at all. An observation hive may be a little bit more difficult than a standard. It's going to be a quite a bit diff but more difficult. But frames, that's a whole different thing. A lot Correct. Of them are too the uh, website had a lot of yep. videos yep. on how to maintain um, maintain yeah. and feed the bees and for sure install them and all kinds of things. Yeah. I've, I've worked with the observation hive for 20 years that we had there and that was the best. And I didn't right. always get these over the winter, right. <laughs> but uh, I do know a little bit about it, but not more. Well, the advantage of this type of uh, observation hive is those frames can actually be taken out so it can overwinter in a normal box just like any other colony. So that's, so that's the, a huge the advantage to that. Vacation. That said, <laughs> you know, the, the reason I ask for volunteers uh, as far as maintaining that hive, because an observation hive is so small, they have a tendency to swarm a lot. So it's definitely going to be a little more fiddly than a normal hive would be. So if you guys happen to have any time and, you know, you're willing to help with that, because you will have to go into an observation hive quite a bit more often than you will a normal hive. So there, there is a it's going to be very heavy, so it's going to take two pretty strong people probably to move it outside to work on it. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Well, Believe me, my old one was pretty heavy, I know it. <laughs> so if we have one person that's a point person, he can get, I'm sure he can get more help. Yeah. Right, you know, I mean, we could probably make, you know, figure out a way to make a dolly or something. Oh yeah, set it well we have, we have wagons and dollies and carts and all kinds of things up there that I've used in the past. So. Have to look at it and see what would work best and how to stabilize <coughs> and stuff. Yeah. yeah, I've got I've got some more wagons that we're using up to put it on. All right. it That's what I used to do with the other one. I just put it on the cart and move it outside. But it right. took two of us to lift it up. <laughs> then we're gonna we're also gonna need somebody to figure out how to mount it on the wall. Yeah, we uh, could probably work with uh, our carpenter here okay. and uh, figure that one out. So yeah, it's got mounting instructions. Those were. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They weren't great, but they were there. Yeah. <laughs> no, this one mounts to the wall because it swings back. Entrance and forth. It's a swing view. We'll talk about it. Oh, okay. Yeah. But that's not good. We got that pretty well handled. All right, new business. Uh, the bees will be back. They should be back on Wednesday, the first load. So they're on their way north, probably. Well, as of half an hour ago, we should have been on the road. Um, I'll end up talking to them later and finding out for sure. The weather has not been cooperative. But they should be back. Uh, so next meeting at 6.30, we'll actually, as long as the weather is above 60, we'll go out and look at the hives and actually do some things. If the weather is still this cold, we won't be go opening any hives. So, you know, keep that in mind. Um, but that's what's going on with the hives. So part of, part of that discussion was next month's meeting, where is it going to be? Is it going to be here or is it going to be out at the plant center? We will be meeting at the plant site, so. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh, thanks, Barry. No snow or anything like that. <laughs> Got a little on the tree to <laughs> uh, What I've done in past meetings, we've tried to park up by the plant site center, but there's really not great parking there. So what I'm suggesting is we park along the road that goes by the aviary and composting. There's plenty of room alongside that road area there for plenty of cars to park and be able to get out if you're coming from and never been here before <laughs> to get up to the plant science center instead of coming to the main drive you come to the service drive where the big water tower is that's our service drive you just drive straight back past the uh, um, the stables the barn and just keep going back towards the wood you'll you'll see the little woodland center which is our uh, maple sugar our sugar shack you'll turn to the left of that, not to the right, but just go back into the woods if you go to the right. <laughs> go to the left, it takes you up to the top of the hill, but you'll see the apiary and the greenhouse up there. That's the road up there. So just kind of, I'll try to get a map out too. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll help if I can get a map out. <laughs> yeah, so will we start gathering at like six o'clock if we want to? Probably 6.30. 6 6.30? Yeah. Well, yeah, six is probably smarter. Takes a little while to go through, especially the first time. All right. Uh, we put it on Facebook if it's been canceled or something. Absolutely. Weather. Absolutely. And yeah, again, it's down rain. We're done. <laughs> I, I do recommend everybody set up a Facebook account and sign up with the uh, Lake County Beekeepers of Ohio 
and go specifically for the group. There's a subgroup on that website, uh, that Facebook page or whatever, that's where we all talk. Um, it's very useful to find out if there's any changes, if there's any kind of thing going on. Uh, I post a lot of links up there, but it's also useful if you guys have any questions. So if you are beekeeping and you notice anything strange, you can put something up there and ask a question. Um, don't forget to also like the Ohio State page. Um, Ohio beekeeping is also another one that's quite useful. The OTS site's the other one. He haunts that quite a bit. Okay. <laughs> He'll talk about that in a minute. Um, all right, Lake County Fair. Uh, I have somebody looking into that so that we can find out what it takes to uh, participate in Lake County Fair as far as submitting honey for, you know, competition and whatnot. I don't really know that much about it right now, but that is something that we're looking into. I just haven't had anybody report back to me yet. Uh, My partner's another, in Florida. Another piece of that should be, uh, do we want to have a booth? So, yeah, I mean, yes, I know you can you can enter your honey and you can do that but should we as the county beekeeper should we have a booth there to basically promote us i would so uh that was that's one of the things i got him looking into uh, oh that's, I, he's I, looking into that also right okay good i do have several traveling observation guys if somebody wanted to actually fantastic take these to the um, we'll probably do that too all right so uh, we have a speaker for May. We have Peggy Garns coming back. She's gonna, um, she was nice enough to be our speaker a little while ago, but she's going to come back and talk about using nooks. So you guys can be ready for that one. We want to talk to the farm parks also about uh, us representing ourselves at some more of the farm park events. So if anybody wants to volunteer to do, um, they have uh, Farm Fest coming up, and they have uh, the shearing days. Shearing coming days coming up in, in uh, May. Would anybody like to volunteer to man a table to discuss that with anybody who might be interested, or just hang around the apiary and talk? I could probably put in part of the time. Sure. We can get we get several people then. Well, for the Farm Fest day, I'll be here the entire day back at the bees. Um, so if, you know, I pretty much have that one covered. Uh, but by all means, any of you are welcome to come on back, um, talk. You know, a lot of times just being in a bee suit, standing around bees, you will attract children. <laughs> they will. Um, if you do it, they will come. <laughs> very true. And that actually ends up being quite fun because what you can do if you have two people, I can't do it necessarily by myself, but what you can do is take one frame of uh, honey or nectar, not always cured yet, but shake off all the bees and walk a giant arc around and back and then let the kids actually stick their finger in the comb and try it because many times they've never actually had straight from the comb honey um, with two people you can do that much harder with one it's good to have a second person to be there to keep people from getting too close to the hives yeah some people know no fear yeah a lot of children have no fear and you know it's good to have them keep some sort of distance. We, we have and, a large mulched area that we put the hives in, so there's sort of a border, but that is always keep open. <laughs> so one person can be pulling out frames, talking, and then somebody else can be just border patrol. <laughs> what is Farm Fest? Uh, 13th and 14th of May. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, uh, so just something to think about. We don't have to have any firm answers yet, but yeah, I'm going to keep answering, asking until somebody down. agrees. Uh, any additional new business? All right, moving on. Uh, announcements. Um, don't forget you have to register your eight beers with the state. So anybody who registered last year should have just in the last day or so gotten a little mailer with their old location you can fill it out and send it right back um, but those should be filled out relatively soon those that have bees coming in if you don't have your hive yet you can't register you absolutely can even if you don't have your bees yet okay. you're registering you know where you're putting them <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't matter how many hives you have it's the location where your hives <clears throat> are going to be the other thing on <clears throat> The other thing on that is on the site it says five dollars to register 
10 after a certain deadline. That's only if you have had a high apiary registered. If you're just getting them in new, you're allowed to wait until you get a man and then do it. So whatever's comfortable. Right. But if you know you've got them coming, there's no real reason to wait. And if you like, I put on the uh, Facebook page, I put a link on there that will take you right to the place where you can register and you can just at least print out the form. I don't know if you can actually do the form online. Or not, um, if they take a credit card for the five dollars or how that exactly works, and it is five dollars per location, not so if you you could have fifty hives at one location, and it's still five dollars. All right, uh, we have the address too if you need to write them, but we can talk about that afterwards. Uh, last thing, and just because you've had it on here. But if anybody needs any sugar, let me know. Uh, I have 2,000 pounds I ordered. It'll be here towards the end of the month. Um, I, I get a substantial discount, so I can pass that on to people. Um, you know, I, I don't really need 2,000 pounds of sugar. But, <laughs> but when the price is right, I mean, it's <laughs> so funny as that is. Do you have a still? Uh, I refuse to answer that on the grounds that you're not. <laughs> this is on YouTube. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I've also started stocking various things. And I'm definitely still cheaper than any of the other, you know, groups. Uh, so if anybody needs any hive tools or smokers, let me know. I'm starting to stock all that kind of stuff. <sighs> all right. That is all I have. Does anybody else have anything they wanted to bring up? Okay. Then we will take a quick five minute break. Do we want to pull tickets first, take a break, and then go to the speaker. Then that way we don't have to hang around after the speaker. We do that. Okay. So everybody get a everybody new ticket. ticket. Everybody get a ticket eligible for a ticket. Or wants a ticket? I'm not sure what your eligibility was. You're here? Yeah. Oh, we got more stuff. So did anybody who came in late, did everybody get a blue ticket? Alright, so you'll be on in just a second. I'll introduce you. Let's really stretch real quick. Since the meeting portion is boring, it's all. What's that? We tried to aim for nine or earlier. Yeah. Everybody got a ticket? No, we got to have Ellen. You'll cheat. That's true. Ellen, come on up here. Uh, like probably 38 cents a pound. Oh, okay. Um, so, we're getting a thousand pounds back. And now we'll be repacking them over into. Um, yeah, I'll plug this one. Okay, last three digits. Four, three, five. Oh, Thank you. Smoke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, this is uh, also, uh, by the way, that smoker was donated by Queen Wright um, Colonies, who's, who gave all the stuff to Ella, and they also gave us a little bag of candy, and there's a, a, a keychain with a light on it, and it's awesome. Four thirty-two. No, that's why they try to get out. Okay. We're not going here. No, no. We got more stuff. Yeah. We got a bail giveaway. I know. 457. Thank you, Matthew. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> I do. Right. 
Four sixty five. Four sixty five. Bingo. Uh, how about another B mail? Four sixty one. All right. Yeah. Lots of stuff. Oh, people. Good odds. Four sixty one. I think that's all we got. Consolation prizes are catalog catalogs from uh, Queen Lake Collins. There's some blue like, sky uh, catalogs and some older Man Lake at the back too. Okay, um, I'll put these in the back. If you want a catalog, grab it. Thank you. You're special. <laughs> all right, back to you, Dan. All right. Uh, so we're going to take a quick five-minute break so everybody can stretch. That was part of the break. That wasn't really a break. I know, you've got to speed it up. But let people at least stretch, so a quick five-minute break. Everybody move around. <laughs> Intermission, somebody dance on the uh, so the bees should uh, the packages should be up starting on the 20th so it really should start happening. Right, and I got the high point. Your guys, I'm just going to summarize myself. I don't know if you're going to struggle. It's not, it's not worth my trouble. So just said, I'm sick. Oh, you can always watch. The, uh, yeah, that's what do. My supplier got behind, oh. and it was just easier to assemble them myself than to be trying to figure out who bought assembled, uh, assembled. So it's one of those things. It's like, yeah, just yeah, build that. Okay. So don't worry about that. We'll make sure that when the packages come in, I'm coming back. Okay. So you can just pop them straight in. You know, like I said, I got you guys. What do you think? Like to catch a swarm? It doesn't work that way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay
You need another one. Your dad was going to have the order. do my NATO Okay. If everybody wants to take their seats, we'll go ahead and I'll introduce the speaker. So I see you train from the podium all the way to the back of the room. So if you need to move. Okay. Well, actually, I can put the slide in the you, you can be anywhere in between there. It's fine. If everybody would take their seats, please. Um, you're too close. You have to be back <laughs> so for those of you who are on Facebook a lot, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the OTS group. Um, that's a group dedicated to the on-the-spot beekeeping method. Uh, you might be familiar with the gentleman we have speaking today because he contributes quite a bit to that forum. Uh, but we have John Schwartz here to talk about that. So without any further ado, I shall give it over to John. Hey, John. So I don't speak very loud. You might want to move up. Uh, by the end of this, the talking time, I'm probably too soft to hear. So feel free to move up. OK, there's, there's my tether. All right, I want to talk about OTS, of course, Dan just mentioned. Thanks, Dan, for, where'd you go? Okay. Thanks for, uh, and Melinda for inviting me. Um, and uh, I want to talk about, give you specifics, um, and introduce to you the, the concepts of OTS, and explain really OTS is standing, stands for on the spot, like Dan mentioned. It's really focused on queenery, but it changes the paradigm a bit for beekeeping compared to what folks, most folks are used to when it comes to raising queens and increasing their colonies. And I just want to maybe try and help expand um, your toolkit, uh, what, what, you, what, what options you have with this, with this methodology to help you in your beekeeping, in your backyard. Uh, number two, I just want to um, explain carefully how you can uh, use this method to raise queens, one, Increase your colonies, prevent swarming, and help manage your mites. That's a lot of stuff. Um, and it doesn't sound like it's possible, but there, just a couple of tweaks to the way you do things can make a big difference in, this, in, in your success. So at the end, too, I just want to field any questions that you might have. I'm sure you'll have. And then also just stop me anytime as we go. 
So about me a little bit, um, from Oregon, my wife Christy is with us and uh, we have six kids and uh, Christy's homeschooled them all. She's a trooper. And uh, we live in Solon, not too far away. And I work for as a, man, a digital manager for uh, truthforlife.org, it's in Bainbridge. And I blog uh, at the Bee Farm, which you can follow. Uh, that's the website. And uh, I post there maybe every couple, two, three weeks, not a lot, but uh, they're long posts, probably way too long, but I like to get them as good as I can. Um, and then also Dan mentioned uh, there's a beekeeping group, OTS uh, Queenery, it's called. And feel free to join that. Um, that's what it looks like. There's a, a bee and a flower. There we are. And then uh, I've been bee, beekeeping since uh, I started reading about beekeeping in 2004. And I read this old novel, and it got me hooked. And, uh, and since 2005, really, um, been keeping bees. Started in Oregon, which is kind of a difficult place to keep bees. And then Alaska, which is almost impossible. In fact, I only met one guy who was successful in Alaska keeping bees, uh, keeping them alive. Um, but so I know like 1%. I don't know much. And as you guys know, the more you get into beekeeping, the less you know. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? So, um, but on the, on the flip side, I want to encourage you. Uh, some of the things that I've learned just in the last five years is all has revolutionized how I do beekeeping and my success. And it's just one small facet. There's other people that do things completely different that are successful as well. I'm not claiming that this way is the way you need to do beekeeping. Okay. So what is uh, what is OTS? I met a guy, Mel Disselcohen is his name. He's from Michigan. Uh, I have no clue. Michigan, I, I'm getting used to Ohio. I don't even know anything about Michigan, but he's from Michigan. And uh, you can find him usually at the uh, Tri-County uh, in Worcester, the, the conference every year. He's always got a table right at the entrance. He's an older gentleman. That's Mel. And he sells a book for way too much, uh, but it's worth every penny. And uh, that's one of the first guys I, I met uh, when we moved here, and I picked up his book after flipping through it. And uh, it just really changed the way I looked at Queen Arena especially. This is his website, just so you have his information. He gives away a ton of this information I'm going to give it to you tonight just for free. Down the middle of that page there, there's a lot of links to PDFs. He usually gives an update once or twice a year, um, less so in the last few years, but there's a lot of backlog there that you can go, you know, just do some research. And that's his book. I brought a copy if you want to flip through it, OTS Cleanery. And I told him we'd be talking tonight. And I'd be mentioning the book, and he said, welcome, or hello from Michigan. So. All right, so OTS. Um, really, it's as simple as, uh, thanks for the water again. OTS is really uh, as simple as, I'm going to borrow a hive tool. Um, when you go to the apiary, your backyard, and uh, the conditions are right, uh, drones are flying mature drones, uh, you've got good weather, you and your hive tool, and a couple minutes, you can be raising queens. It's that simple. And really, in a nutshell, and I'll get into more detail, in a nutshell, I'll show you a couple pictures. It's just taking your hive tool and inserting it all the way to the midrib and bending down. You're just, you're just inserting that at the very you're the bottom of the cell shaped like this, and you've got the bottom floor of the cell. That's where you're inserting the hive tool all the way to the midrib and bending down, flattening it. And what you're doing, all you're doing is creating space for those bees to pull out a queen cell vertically. And for some reason, when you do that, and you've removed the queen from the hive, the bees are directed to that spot. You're assisting them, and for some reason, they begin to build out cells. It's, it's really that simple. That concept... Um, changes some paradigms. We'll talk about that um, in a bit. <coughs> so there's a picture right here where Mel has gone in and um, inserted the hive tool underneath 36 hour or less larva. So when as you as you get involved in beekeeping and, and you start doing your inspections, you start to notice some things right off the bat. You're looking for eggs. You're looking for little shiny spots at the bottom of the cell, which tells you what 
little dab of royal jelly there. Uh, probably the egg has just emerged. It actually, the, the skin dissolves. They don't hatch or emerge. It dissolves, and they lay down flat on the bottom of the cell. And you can start to recognize the age of those larvae by just locating the, the tiniest little glistening spots on the bottom of the cell where those eggs have just emerged and laid down. And those are the perfect larvae to notch under. That's what you're, you're looking for, and that's what he's done right there. Here's another picture. Um, usually those tiny larvae are, are just, uh, these actually, these are C-shaped. Sometimes they're even less than C-shaped, just barely curved, but this is what they're gonna look like, about that size. And he's taking his hive tool straight in and bend it down. You can take a stick if you want, a little twig, or uh, any kind of a tool that you can cut into that wax and bend it down. That's all that's, that's required. So this changes some paradigm, paradigms. Uh, that the current paradigm for me up until a few years ago was uh, I lose most of my bees and I'm going to buy bees every year. I'm either buying queens or I'm buying package bees or I'm buying nukes every year. And it, interestingly, I was just at the Wooster conference and sat down eating donuts and just listening to people. Every last person I talked to this winter lost all their hives or maybe all but one or two uh, from all over the state and, and out, out of the state. Um, and that's just the, 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 the paradigm has been a dependence on uh, queen and bee growers from California, Georgia, Florida, really, right? That's where we get our bees for the most part. The new paradigm with this uh, little system, OTS, it's moved that power from that structure from outside our state into your backyard. You know, it's so easy uh, to raise a quality queen and to multiply your highs. It's, it's giving you now new options that you didn't have before that, that cost nothing. Um, my problem in the last few years has not been buying bees or spending money on bees. It's been, how am I going to buy all the boxes I'm going to need to facilitate all this growth and how do I get rid of bees? So I'm having to sell nukes. And I'm having to get rid of bees uh, to friends down the street. So that's been my problem. I think that's a good problem to have. I, I would think you guys would think the same. Shameless um, says, Mitch, uh, do you still have any nukes available? I don't. There's, I don't even market my nukes because that's the paradigm. Everyone needs bees so badly. Plus, there's lots of new pe beekeepers coming into the, the fold as well. It's not just people losing their bees. But, but you did sell out. I sold out, and I probably, and that's overwintered nukes is what I like to sell. And then in July, uh, end of June, I'm making splits just the normal way um, with new queens. So and I'll have some more. Thanks, Dan. No problem. Um, a bonus as you think about it, uh, instead of bringing bees in from a, a small group of producers in California and Florida, it creates a genetic bottleneck. Instead of that occurring now, all of a sudden, all of you, all of us, in our locale here with our damp, cold, um, et cetera, all the problems we've got. Um, I'm sure Dan and Richard are really working hard on developing strains that, that overwinter here. Um, all of a sudden, we're developing our own strains of bees that overwinter well in Ohio. And we're not dependent upon a, a tight bottleneck of DNA coming from the same producer every year that may or may not uh, survive here in Ohio. Uh, Mel likes to say and he, his goal is that you would never buy bees again and that's been my experience the last five six years so um, that's the goal. So the basic outline of OTS cleanery like I mentioned uh, right now is not a good time to do, do OTS because uh, I don't have mature drones, at least not the like last time I looked. Have any of you seen drones at all? Not in Ohio. Not in Ohio, yeah. So not for a while. Um, but typically, um, typically for the last couple of years, it's been April 21st through May 1st for me when I felt like it's uh, I've, I'm seeing enough mature drones, the weather's good, my hives are starting to expand. I, I have perennial nuts 
uh, who knows what they are now. No one can tell you what a B really is. Um, but um, my, my Carniolans uh, overwinter small clusters and then expand really quickly. Uh, Italians are more uh, overwinter in a large cluster. So anyways, once the, once, the, once the timing's right, probably in the next three weeks for us right now is the way it's looking, um, what I do is I either, in the, in the spring actually, I'm removing the queen from that colony. Let's just focus on one colony. I'm removing the queen and I have two frames of brood and I'm putting it in a nuke. I'm also taking a frame of honey and putting it in that nuke and uh, an empty frame of comb that she can lay in. I've got uh, an overwintered nuke, uh, a split. It's called an artificial swarm. So I'm doing that a week before swarm season. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But I've created a, I've created a nuke in my original hive. Now there's no longer a laying queen. It's queenless. Within a few minutes, that hive is recognizing, hey, we've lost our queen. We need to create a queen. So that's when you grab your hive tool and you're looking for every frame of comb in there that's got uh, just emerged larva, and you're making a notch or two on every frame that has uh, larva available for notching. You close back the close the hive up. You usually are going to move that nuke uh, a couple miles away. I don't. I I've, I've just been leaving them in the same yard and having no problems. But most people, I, I recommend moving it away two miles. A week later, you go back to that original colony. You open it up, and you're going to find on every frame you notched, queen cells, beautiful queen cells, more than you can handle, right? Now, in the past, uh, I looked at queens like uh, I would get really nervous around a queen because I didn't want to hurt it. These days, I can raise so many queens with OTS, they're like a dispensable commodity. Uh, they're, like, um, they're like a drone or, or a worker almost to me um, because I'm able to raise all these queen cells quality queen cells, and I have options now. So what I do then is I've got usually mm, end of April, May 1st, I've got, I started with maybe six to eight frames of, of brood at the most. I've taken out two. A week later, I go back to that colony. I've got about six frames of brood left, capped brood. And I've got maybe two or three frames with queen cells on them. I've got options. I can keep that hive together, or I can split it into up to three. I can do the same thing I just did with that original queen with these queen cells. And, and that's typically what I do is split that into, in half. So a week earlier, I had one overwinter colony. Now I've got three colonies, one with a laying queen, two that are going to be mated. And typically, any, any queen producer is going to see between an 85 90% mating success rate. And you can just about count on about 90%. One out of 10 are just going to fail. They're going to get eaten by a bird or whatever. So I have created three colonies. They're on the same pallet. Usually I keep them on the same pallet. And 30 days from when I first notched that original colony, I can come back. I can leave them alone. I can come back 30 days later, and I'm going to have laying queens in those hives. And I'm going to have three colonies. And here's the cool part. In about June 21st to July 4th, anywhere in there, you can do the whole thing all over again to every single colony. I can take one colony every year and make it into 10 without fail every year. It, I'm only limited by the number of boxes and space in my backyard. How much does that limit colony production? It's a good question. Uh, if you're going to be splitting that aggressively, you're not going to get much honey. You're going to get some. Actually, if you think about it, you're going to maybe harvest a frame or two of honey at the most from every colony throughout the course of the, if you have, you know, all things being equal and you have a good flow. Times 10, it's still a box of honey, right? But there's options that you've got. Um, say, this is what I would do if I was going to go for honey. Um, I would split those. I would be, I would create the initial three colonies, right? And what's... What's your flow here, the one you really shoot for? What time of year? It really depends. Uh, we have a pretty good flow very early, the linen flow. Mm -hmm. uh, but probably our largest flow is going to be goldenrod in the fall. Yeah, goldenrod. 
I've got a decent I've got a decent flow in my neighborhood because it's all planted in basswood, linden trees. Uh, that's around end of June, early July. Depends on the year. Um, I what I want to do is uh, I've got options. You can take those those uh, all those different splits and simply recombine them at the right time. Okay, so say I had taken one colony and I've made it into um, eight by uh, the, the middle of June, and I want to go, I'm going to say half of them for honey. I can take four of them and recombine them into two colonies, two nice honey colonies, or I can make one big giant uh, colony by just removing all the queens but one and doing a paper combine with all those colonies together. And or um, what I do every July is I kill every queen in my yard. And you can take, and I have them all requeen themselves, and you have this brood break for 30 days that you time with the flow. So even a small colony uh, can capture the entire, for 30 days they've got no brood to, to rear, no, no brood to feed. Usually a full strength colony will go through 60 pounds of honey just to raise the, the bees for a month. If, they, if you don't have those bees, and you've removed the queen, there's no brood, you've given them a brood break, you got 60 pounds or more honey um, that you can harvest. So there's there's ways you can combine, recombine those colonies and create honey hives. I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like. So here, uh, any questions? Am I making sense? Yeah. Um, let me use this tool. It's a point. So I'll just reiterate. Uh, this is your original over winter colony. Okay. This is your two frames of brood and your your original queen that you've made a split with an artificial swarm. Okay. You now have here after you've taken her out, you have your cell builder. Okay, with about six frames of, of brood. Um, you can also. Uh, what he's saying here is you can also not split out your queen. You can just kill the queen and make a honey hive. That's what he's saying. So, um, so now you've got you've got your May first uh, split, the artificial swarm. You've got a cell builder. Uh, a week later, right here is where you would make your three starts. He calls them splits, with two frames of brood in each one and a queen cell in each one. So. Three weeks from that point, you're going to have most likely three mated, mated colonies and a fourth up top with the, the original queen. Okay. Then in uh, July, end of June here or July, um, you've got options. The top option, you could split them all again, remove the queens, raise your queens, and have four new splits going into winter, or you could make them a bit stronger, two or three, two or three per hive, or you can say, um, I'm going to go for uh, four frames of brood and honey, or just one big eight frame honey producer. So you've got a lot of different options. Does that make sense? I think so. So <laughs> increasing uh, colonies with OTS, OTS and artificial swarms. So the problem most people have is losing too many bees. The solution is, as we've talked about, you can learn to split and grow your colonies using OTS to raise queens without spending a penny on bees. So the, the, the idea here is, in the past, you've, we've been dependent on keeping our bees alive. If we lose it, we're out. I've got no options. I've got to go buy bees. I've got to find, I've got to go, Dan, Dan, can I bum a queen? Uh, Dan, can you give me a nuke? i got to start all over again, or you just got to wait a whole other year. Instead, with this system, you're creating many hives in your backyard, or more than you normally would. Say, say you're used to having two hives in your backyard. That's a gamble. Uh, what if you lose one of those to mites? What if both of those don't overwinter? You're, you're buying bees again. But what if it's instead you raise 10 colonies, or eight, or six? Your goal might be to overwinter four or five in hopes you get three through the winter. Now you've got options. Come next winter, you've got three overwinter colonies that you can turn into 30 if you really wanted to. Okay. 
So what it's doing is you're outbreeding your problems. Uh, your problems might be mites. They might be what's what's some of the reasons, main reasons you're seeing bees die? Almost inevitably, you can blame mites. Yeah. If it's not the mites directly, it usually ends up being a disease that the mites themselves have spread. Okay. Yeah. It's almost always mites. That's that's my experience in the last five years. It's been uh, I see a hive get really robust and then all of a sudden just collapse. And that's mites, it's classic. Or I see a uh, K-wing uh, or wandering bees in the grass out front. That means they're sick with parasitic mite syndrome or a number of other different diseases that are occurring because the mites are injuring the bees. Uh, they may not be outright killing them, but they're, they're injuring them and causing disease to be vectored through those injuries. Um, or just a uh, feeding the, the parasitic nature of feeding on the larva in the cell it just makes them susceptible to disease so um, so that's one way to combat it, combat this issue you have with losing all your bees and having to buy bees is is out produce them but expect some losses that's just normal it, you know uh, if any kind of endeavor that we go through in life we're always we always want to hedge our bets a little bit do a little bit more than we need to knowing that we're going to get some losses Um, one thing, too, uh, the Mel preaches that, that I have seen really successful for my, my apiary is not letting my bees swarm. And so I'm doing this OTS procedure every year, and it's a little different every year depending on the weather, and that's where a club is really helpful. You guys can be exchanging notes. What do you think this year? Uh, when should we... Um, <clears throat> when is it going to be dangerous uh, time for swarming? When? when uh, what do you guys think? And where when you're just on your own and in, on your own, it's really tough to, to figure that out, uh, especially if you're a new beekeeper. But uh, probably around April 26 to May 1st, for me, uh, I'm is about a week or so before, maybe two weeks before swarm season is coming. And what I'm doing is I'm artificial swarming a week or two in advance of swarm season. So I'm not gonna. I don't want to let my bees swarm. Uh, a strong colony especially, I'm going to artificial swarm. I actually artificial swarm every colony in the yard May 1st, around then. And instead of losing that queen, honey, bees, my money, time, into my neighbor's yard or off into the woods, uh, instead I'm swarming it myself. I've got control over those bees, okay? Now the, it begs the question, well, aren't I weakening my colony to the point where I can't you know, harvest honey or increase bees. And on the, on the outside, it looks like that might be the case. But the reality is, a month later, I've got four or five colonies producing, just, just do the math, how many eggs are being laid a day by four or five queens as opposed to one queen. And then I can recombine those at any time and do whatever I want to do with my bees. So. The issue is not having a, a high capacity colony all year long. The issue is having a high capacity colony when you need it, right before a flow or right before you're going to want to produce nukes to sell or to, to, to increase, et cetera. So does that make sense? OK. Um, so I haven't lost a swarm. I used, to, I, used to, I used to run down the street in Oregon chasing swarms and people wondering what's going on. Uh, but I haven't lost a swarm in about five, five or six years now. And all of my colonies are in my backyard, out the back fence. My kids watch my bees all day long. They see them. Uh, also, I'm always in my hives. I can tell if you know, it's queenless or not, or it's had queen cells, et cetera. So I honestly haven't lost a swarm in at least five years. And it's because I'm artificial swarming just before um, swarm season using OTS. So that's, uh, I, I did a blog post a couple years ago. This is my backyard by the railroad tracks. I went from uh, May 1st, 11 colonies that were over winter to, to 26 plus nine that I sold. And just, it's, it's amazing. 11 colonies that year turned into like 60 or 70. And I sold maybe 20, 25, I don't remember how many. But uh, that's a typical, uh, what my yard typically looks like using OTS. And, 
And as you can see, I'm cobbling together whatever I can to stick bees in because I don't have enough space. I'm, you know, building stuff. I'm buying old stuff, uh, whatever. Um, these days, I make enough for from nuke sales to just buy whatever equipment I want and have left over. So. Um, an important part, I mentioned it at the beginning, was the suppression of mites. And I want to explain what that means. Um, Rand, uh, what's his name? Was just at the. Uh, Randy, was, Oliver. Randy Oliver. Randy, and then another guy, too, uh, the other guy, uh, Jamie Ellis. Jamie, Jamie, Jamie Ellis. Ellis. Uh, his stuff, if you can go back and find it, I did a blog post on Jamie's presentation, but it's so very good um, on the idea of he's from Florida, University of Florida. He's been doing bees forever, and uh, he's a researcher, and um, that's all he focuses on really is mites. And really, he preached to us in Worcester. Um, is, I said it right, not Worcester, Worcester. Um, I'm from Alaska. <laughs> uh, he preached to us the need to sample, sample, sample. He just drilled it into us. You need to sample, and I really highly suggest uh, uh, one of the man makers uh, sells a plastic, orange and white, a uh, plastic mite sampler that you it has like a, a cup within a cup with a sieve, and with a with a handy mark, you, you dump bees in, scrape bees in. To a certain mark, it gives you 300 bees. You just just enough alcohol to cover those bees, tighten up the lid good, and you shake it for the same amount of seconds, the same uh, aggressiveness for like a minute, two minutes, and then at the bottom, the mites can the bees are at the top, the mites sink to the bottom. You can do a quick count. You've got to be doing that for every colony, three times a year, uh, for us here. Uh, probably May, July. September. I mean, what do you? How often do you sample them? Oh, I check more often than that. More often than that. Yeah. Okay, but at a minimum, every other month, Jamie said you got to be at least every other month sampling. And I check ten percent of every yard once a month. Yes. So. And if you've got four, five, six hives, do them all. If you've got 50, 60 hives, do ten percent, and and let it educate you. What's my yard doing? What do I need to do to this yard to, to, to treat it, etc. Anyways, back to suppressing mites. Um, OTS, like I mentioned, creates a brood break. 30 days, and you got to understand that the mites, on the fifth day, just before larvae are capped, those mites jump into the, the cell. It's capped over, uh, I forget the, the exacts, but I think the first, uh, there's an egg laid, the first one that hatches is a, a male, and from then on it's females, I think is the, the way it goes. So a bunch of mites are growing in that in that uh, cell, when that bee emerges, all those mites come out, and basically every 13 days, your mites are almost doubling every 13 days. So just think about the exponential value, how quickly mites can ruin your hive. <coughs> if you had, if you checked uh, July or yeah July 1st and you only saw one mite, it doesn't mean anything. You need to check again because uh, they can really. Um, they can exponentially uh, overtake your hive. Anyways, all the, if, if I remove the queen from the hive, obviously there's not, there's no queen laying in that hive uh, for 30 days. Okay. Uh, on the 24th day, after I killed that queen or removed her from the hive, every last bee has emerged from the cells, including drones. So on the 25th day, 24th day, there's no bees under. Um, under capping, okay? The new queen comes back into the hive and she starts mating. And what's going to what's gonna happen is you're sacrificing the first four or 500 bees to the mites. All these mites have been in that hive waiting for larvae to eat, nothing to eat. She starts laying. On the fifth day after she starts laying, there's larvae about ready to be capped. All the mites jump into those cells, too many mites. They're capped over. There's too many mites that can live off of just one larva, and they starve. And that's what happens. You can now. It's not in a. It's it's not going to get every mite in your hive, um, but there's two things that are going to happen. You're going to have some mites self-destruct, and you're also preventing them from exponentially increasing for for 30 days. You're letting the mites or the bees catch up with the mites and out surpass them uh, through egg laying, uh, brood rearing. So that. 
that especially in July for us here in Ohio can really put a damper on mites. In fact, I haven't been treating for mites other than OTS until this last year when I started checking with alcohol and realizing, oh, I need to, I need to do another method, either formic, uh, the MAC, uh, however you say that, MAQS strips, or oxalic acid is what, I, what I'm doing now, the vapor. And here's the cool part. With a brood break, on that 25th day when every mite is actually phoretic, clinging to a bee, there's no mite under a capping, that's a perfect time to do oxalic vapor. You're going to kill just about every mite in the hive. And, uh, and then you're going to have that queen lay, and it's going to be fresh, uninjured, young bees going into fall and winter. So that's the way that uh, brood breaks can suppress mites in your, in your apiary. Any questions about that? Yeah. So I've compiled, there's a blog post uh, about this, seven keys to successful, here, or you could reread this, seven lessons that I've learned um, about this OTS. Number one, only healthy colonies with substantial resources can raise queens, quality queens. The biggest mistake people make with raising queens on their own is not enough bee density uh, to raise uh, healthy queens. So a good, uh, a queen that's raised uh, to maturity, uh, they need to stack that cell with royal jelly into her entire life until they cap it. In, the, in a hive that doesn't have enough bee density, you're not getting enough royal jelly in that cell. Uh, maybe even not enough quality royal jelly. There's there's different uh, thinking about this, but um, Mel defines a quality or a strong enough colony to raise queens with this method as one that has at least four frames of brood, and that would be in one box. You wouldn't want it any, any bigger than one box, but at least four <coughs> frames of brood. Number two, strong hives must always do the work of building uh, queen cells. That's self-explanatory. Number three, the two-step, one-week process. It's two steps. The first week, I'm removing the queen as an artificial swarm, and I'm notching in the, the queenless colony. I'm coming back the second step one week later, seven days later, and I'm going into the colony, and I'm looking for queen cells. And then a key uh, for when you make your new starts, your new splits, is leaving only one or two queen cells with that split. You don't want... A bunch of, like, a lot of people make the mistake of leaving eight or ten cells in there. The first one might hatch and go get mated, and you got virgins then doing after swarms. Uh, you can get into uh, queens fighting each other and getting injured. You just don't, you just don't want to take that risk. So you want to leave just one or two cells in that uh, colony. Number four, for us in Ohio, there's a couple key times to notch right before swarm season, about a week, and that'd be about. May 1st, and then post solstice, about June 21st, June 22nd to July 1st, anywhere in there, uh, post solstice, because this is a cool part as well about mite suppression. Uh, a typical queen, a typical colony that with a queen building up right now, April, May, they're going to let her lay strong until about um, mm, August. I think it's August. And then she's going to quickly ramp down. But when I when I raise a queen in July, she starts laying August 1st. They let her begin laying like a spring queen again. And she can help outbreed mite issues in the hive. She can catch up with that brood break so you have enough bees going into winter. It's kind of counterintuitive. It feels like I shouldn't be killing my queen July 1st. We got fall approaching, but it actually works out because uh, post-solstice queens, for whatever reason, those bees let her lay like a spring queen. They, they feed her enough and uh, move her around the hive to help, help her lay. Um, number six, we talked about number five. Number six, be ruthless with a week or laying worker hives. This is another paradigm shift for me. In the past, I would babysit. I would, I would try and rescue every last little weak hive in my yard, right? Uh, because if I lost it, I have to go buy more bees. But now with the ability to raise queens so easily and, and to split my hives, 
it's not cost effective, and I don't want to perpetuate weak genetics or sickness or disease. Uh, I'm ruthless now with weak hives. And, and you can hear like Kirk Webster and some other guys online talk about this. Not Kirk, but um, um, the, the New Hampshire guy, Vermont guy. Um, anyways, Dr. Palmer. Palmer. Yeah, Palmer, he's a big preacher of don't get rid of, break up your weak hives and, and, and use those resources in, in your other colonies. That's really important to do. You, it'll help you uh, put your energies behind good genetics, good queens, good bees, instead of wasting your time and resources on trying to prop up sick hives. And then number seven, I mentioned, uh, make sure you have enough boxes on hand because you're gonna you're gonna need them. So, any questions? When you're doing this, do you lay on the bee home really heavy or? I probably should, but I don't. Okay. I've taken a if they're going to live, they're going to live approach. And if they're going to, um, I, I, I must say I'm really careful with the weather and, and the flows, how things are going, uh, or how much I split them. If it's a, it seems like a bad year, we had a really rainy June um, two or three years ago. Um, I'll be careful with um, how, I, how aggressively I split them, how much feed I give them. But I don't, I don't feed them at all. So if, if you... <clears throat> reduce the amount of damage that you're doing with mites. What do you, what are you finding to be uh, what you're working against the most as far as damage in your hives? It's still mites. It's still mites. Yeah, and I've, and I've seen that more over the last couple of years, <clears throat> and that's pushed me to do oxalic alongside. Now, you went to a vaporizer. What type of vaporizer? Yeah, I use? actually bought the nice one, um, the ProVap. Okay. And it's like 400 bucks. Because it only takes 30 seconds. Per hive, I've got 60 hives at that point in the year, right. 70 hives. I want it to go quick. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Now I think you can dribble, oxalic dribble. I think Richard does that. He's yeah. a big proponent of dribbling. That works. Uh, the max work, the formic strips. Really Not well. Not well, really. Not well. Oh. I, if you go online, you'll often hear right now talked about using uh, oxalic acid mixed with glycerin and put on a paper towel, um, specifically the Scott's paper towels. That is still an experimental phase. Uh, Randy Oliver talks about it on his website, but that is still technically illegal to do. Keep that in mind. Okay. But because I talk to a lot of the commercial guys, because I'm in that world, uh, I hear about the guys who are doing it anyway. And I have to tell you, the results are either fantastic or horrific. There's no middle ground. Um, I know some guys who have killed a thousand hives at a crack doing that method because they burned their bees. So I highly recommend you don't do that at the moment. Okay. It's not yeah, perfected. Like still out. He doesn't, because sometimes his mites Correct. Explore, so he still has them. Correct. He hasn't figured it out. Yet. It has not been figured out enough that, that, that is a reliable method. Last year, you had to start again this year because right. It, it is not a reliable enough method right now to even consider. It sounds exciting. We'll ignore that one. <laughs> I didn't say that one. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, the formic, the I, I've had a couple of people I helped that it, it's worked okay. So. And there's the formic has really got to be careful with temperature. Yeah. When you're when you're splitting and you're moving a queen to say a nuke. Like, I'm, I don't know nothing about bees. So if you're moving a queen to a nuke mm -hmm. and with the brood, so on and so forth, my question is, why doesn't that queen go back to where it came from? She, she'll she stick with that in that yeah, news. Wow. That's amazing. She just, they stay put. Now, if I kept it in the same yard, the forager bees, or at least a good chunk of them, will fly back to the old hives because they're used to that spot. They've been out getting nectar. They're zeroed in on that spot. They're going to go back. You can you can help them reorient by throwing a bunch of brush in front of it. It could be just a wives' tail. It seems to work for me. I throw a bunch of uh, leafy uh, branch in front. It forces them to uh, work to get out, and then they reorient in front of the hive. You can watch them, and then they seem to come back. Uh, it seems to work. But the queen, as long as she's on a frame of of brood and able to lay, and she's got the same her offspring around her, she, she'll stay put. So you have to move her kids with her. Yeah, yeah. If you don't, 
if you're introducing a new queen, you just have to do it carefully. You have to do it gradually. Um, you know, and there's different methods for that. I don't know what you guys preach for that, but um, um, typically I would keep her in the cage um, for you know a couple days, three days before I release her. So when I create that split, just to reiterate, usually you're going to find her on a frame with eggs, larvae, and brood, somewhere in the middle of or in the in the brood chamber. You're taking her out, so you, usually you're going to have like at least a half frame of brood, cat brood, with her. And I'm sticking her right in the middle. Then I go right back and find the best frame of cat brood I can find, usually. Take that out with the bees on it, stick it in. And then I'm going back and looking for a couple more frames of brood, because it's got nurse bees on there. They're smaller. They're, they move slower. They haven't been outside the hive yet. Their job is taking care of brood. I'm shaking two shakes of bees, uh, of nurse bees, with her as well, and move, putting those back. And then I need to give her a full frame of honey, especially, and, and looking for one that has pollen on it. If not, I might uh, find another one with a half frame of pollen and empty cells uh, with her. That would make a nice nuke, and I would need to put another box on her you know, in that, another week or two, or, or less. Queen. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> that really is, I think, one of the the weakest areas for most beekeepers uh, that I talk to is finding a queen. And I think it just takes diligence and practice, and not being afraid, and keep trying, and and learning the the tips for doing that. Now, one thing that I've noticed in the past, and I imagine you've noticed it as well, when you mate your own queens, okay. A lot of times, commercial produced queens, they've been queen banked for a short period of time. So they don't actually develop the full swollen ovaries and the, the length that you see in one that you've made it in your own yard. Have you noticed that your queens are substantially larger than the ones you buy? Oh, yeah. That does make it easier to spot them when yeah. she's a full centimeter or two too long compared to the yeah. drones. Okay. She lumbers around. So that is one advantage of raising your own queens. It's one of the reasons why we're going to be raising queens at the farm parks. Because right now I'm buying queens from a breeder who's running a Canadian line so that I'm getting northern stock in Florida because I don't want southern bees. But because I know that there's that banking delay, I know that the ovaries have never fully lengthened. Okay. That is a very important distinction when you're doing it this way. It will be a substantially bigger queen. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> you, were, you were saying something like uh, in July, if you're putting your queen in the spring mode. Say again? In July, you're putting your, your queen into a spring sort of breeding session. Yeah, yeah what I do in, July, in, uh, in the summer is I actually remove every queen in my yard. I kill them or give them away. And I, I want to requeen every colony in my yard. I want a new queen going into um, into fall, into fall. And, I, and I want all the young bees that she's going to produce in August and September, even October, uh, going into fall that aren't injured by mites. And that's a whole total paradigm shift. And some people think that's crazy because we're used to trying to keep a queen alive for two or three years. Like that's a, a great thing, and it is in the past. But things are changing with pesticide pressure, uh, genetic pressure. Uh, keeping a queen alive for a couple of years is difficult. And so. Let me ask you this then. Today I was uh, I, I watching something and uh, got a bell curve of the bees and, and then they and they ramped down at a certain period. Right. And then the bell curve of the, the varroa. Right. Uh, once once the bees start coming down. The bell curve of the, the varroa are peaky. Right. At the same time, they're dropping. Right. That's so class. Discuss that. Yeah, it does. That that's where people lose their bees. Is when it starts when it hits that when the mites catch up with the bees right there. It's a collapse. You you got maybe two or three weeks left, and your hive's dead. And uh, so so the, 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 the July method. I'll just call it the July method. Yeah. Um, that's helping because you're 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 ramping up the same time the varroa is ramping. Yeah, I wish I had um, 
Uh, so I can post a rubric. I can oh. post a chart that exactly addresses what you're talking about to the the meeting uh, Facebook link. And what happens with with uh, when I kill the queen, I notch and I'm raising a new queen. My the mite levels stops, right? And so do the bees. Then my 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 new queen starts laying and my bee numbers rocket. And a lot of my mites my mites actually drops because I. It's killing a lot of those mites uh, in the cells. That's that's when there's mite over, when uh, the the mites overload the cells. There's too many feeding off of one larva on the fifth day when she starts to lay again. The new queen. They simply perish because they starve to death. Yeah. They end up killing that first 500 bees that are in the cells. They all go into, you know, predate against those young larvae. Those young larvae die on them while they're trying to feed, but they're capped in. They don't have the strength to even claw their way out. But I'm happy. Yeah, happy to let 500 bees perish to save a colony. No big deal. Absolutely. It's about what you get in a wash, too, anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you talk about the queens like that. Did you hear Randy Oliver down at Tri State when he was doing similar? He's taking. So he's taking a thousand, they operate between 1,000 and 1,500 hives. They're monitoring your hives for, for varroa. <clears throat> As the ones get higher, they're taken to it, they're marked, and they keep going down. He's keeping like 2% of his queens. Mm -hmm. And he's only keeping the strongest and the most successful ones. Mm -hmm. He's wiping out the other, the whole, you know, to mm -hmm. wipe out 1,000 hive queens mm -hmm. and just grab off those mm -hmm. for. And I was wondering how that work up here. So thank you. That's uh, yeah. So with this method, the best bee in my yard is the one that survives a winter, right? That, that's that's. It may not be perfect, but I'll take a, a surviving colony that's giving me good honey and and making it over the winter. And and then that over time, with us all doing the same thing in diff our different ways, uh, it's going to help. Is um, what you've talked about tonight, is all that outlined in that uh, OTS Queen Bearing book? Uh, yes, right. Mm -hmm. Much better than I did. <laughs> Actually, there's no Russell Paul River, man. He had to have a talk at one of these. Yes. He clubs for a couple hour talk. I don't know right. which one it is, but you find that. Yeah, he, he spoke at the you Indiana. If that, you'll find his talk. And, mm -hmm. He's uh, yeah. There's a he, sp he spoke at yeah. This is He spoke at the Indiana Beekeepers, some the Indiana Club, you know, a few years ago. There's links on that in, in the Facebook. Does the graph? I have. Yeah. So I, how does that compare? I mean, this seems I can see pros and cons for both. And um, what is your? If I was going to sell queens, or if I was going to expand rapidly to a thousand or two thousand colonies, I'm going to I'm going to graph. It's just better use of my time. Um, but. For 99% of beekeepers, we don't necessarily need to. I think it's a good skill to learn and, and to try. It's amazing. It's just amazing to grow 50 or 60 cells in one, you know, at one time. So, can you spell the author's name? Yeah, Mel, M E L. This will call it. Let me just back up. <laughs> there he is. And his website, MDA Splitter. He, he that's a, a a proprietary tool we created a long time ago. I built him a website, but he won't use it yet. So, how much is the book? The book is way too much. It's seventy-five dollars. <laughs> well, we can cut that out of the video, maybe, right? Too many slides. Um, no, it's okay. I mean, I said the same to Mel, and uh, but Mel says, "What's how much do you spend buying a new colony of bees?" Yeah. And if Almost this half the price of a new right, if this helps you be self-sustainable, it's worth every penny. I agree. I am glad about the book. So. Small scale publishing is very expensive. It too. is. Yeah. And he just he ships it from his home and <laughs> puts them together himself. So. I will try to put a link on the YouTube video to that book. So, 
there's people in here know that this, they're getting their bees next in the next few weeks and they're starting out perhaps they have not, no overwinter what do you suggest for them um growing them as you know feeding them uh, as much as you can getting them as strong as you can by if you're going to do this method as strong as you can by july first and if you've got six eight frames of brood which is doable by july they're a good candidate for for ots <coughs> I highly recommend on that note, if you want to get them that strong, feed for seven days, don't feed for five. Feed for seven days, don't feed for five. Good. Keep that cycle rolling. What that does is that it allows you to feed them heavily. They will store some of that nectar uh, and they will be basically artificially honey bound with the sugar feed, okay? That five days of not feeding them will open up some of the comb. Uh, comb. The queen will immediately fill it with eggs. Now that they don't have that comb anymore, it will force them to draw out more comb quicker, and that cycle will repeat. Uh, by doing it that way, instead of just constantly feeding them, you ensure that you're actually going to get more generations and a rolling growth. Yeah. You can, when you first get a new package, overfeed them to the point where they flat will not grow. And that's something I see and often happens with new people in packages. So, so you do that with a brand new package? Absolutely. Seven, five, seven, five, seven, five, five, seven, seven, five. Keep seven, doing that until one, it's one, drawn out. What's that? One, one, or two to one. Uh, actually, I usually go two to one the wrong way. So I go two parts water to one part sugar, especially in the spring because I want it to simulate nectar. I don't want them to store it. They're going to, but I don't want them to. Really, the, the key is, is comb building. That's, that's the, the secret to um, long-term success is, is you're always looking for comb is so valuable and getting them to build the comb and making sure, like you said, you have open comb for the, the, the queen to lay in. And so reading up on checkerboarding and all the ways that you can manipulate things to get them to build comb quicker uh, it's worth your time looking into checkerboarding and things like that. So. All right. Thanks for letting me talk. <laughs>